good to see everyone in the Lord's house. And we are glad that you are here. There's a lot of talk in our day about unity and the importance of it. And I want to hopefully shed some light on that this morning. I'm going to confess, in 28 years of ministry, I have never preached on this passage. As I began to study it and prepare for this week, I learned why I've never preached on this passage. Because in this section of Scripture, uh, you go from God killing people to blessing them. And it's all in one little compact thing. Does that seem inconsistent? Well, to the naked eye, to the unbeliever, it might seem inconsistent. But the reality is it's not at all. Because unity in the body is very important to our Lord. Now, unity is being called for a lot. And unity is being touted as a major attribute of the church, and it should be, and it is. But the reality is, as Adrian Rogers said once, better uh, division in truth than unity in error. There's an awful lot today, let's all get together, and it amounts to unity in error where they discount or ignore or throw out Holy Scripture rather than embracing it. Folks, this morning I want to talk about the power of unity in Christ. Amen. Now, unity might unity in the secular may generate some things. There's a synergy that takes place when people get together around a common cause. And I can remember uh, when we uh, fought the lottery that uh, it just you ended up with amazing bedfellows as you worked on this cause because guess what? The racetrack people were against it too and the casino people were against it. And we ended up working with them around a common cause. So when you've got a common cause, you can work with people that you differ with on a lot of things. But folks, there's only one true gospel. It's the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ and Him alone. And folks, so many churches today are trying to generate unity around a set of doctrines or around an atmosphere or around a certain worship style or around a certain dress code. There's all kinds of unity being touted and promoted under the guise of Christianity. Folks, in churches today, there are some that hire experts to come in and teach them how to brand themselves, to market themselves, to reach their market share. Does that sound like God's in the middle of all that? Folks, the problem is they're trying to promote a product rather than gospel truth. Because the unifying factor here for us, for the church, should be and always ought to be that mankind is lost in sin. He needs salvation. He needs a Savior. And if we don't promote that reality and help them come to know that Jesus loves them and has a plan for their life and offers forgiveness, folks, friends, family, I don't care how much you like them, they're going to hell. And the gospel needs to be our unifying factor that people are hearing and understand and come to. Will it draw the masses? Not always. But what I'm finding is that people are hungry for truth. And some don't like what they hear because it begins to go counter to their lifestyle, their chosen lifestyle or choices they've made. And it begins to rub them like sin people. And they condemn the messenger or the organization rather than embracing the truth. There are a lot of people doing that. They will do that. They did that during the time of Christ. They do it in our day. But folks, when we come together in the Spirit of the Lord and we pray for the filling of the Lord and we allow the cleansing of the Lord and we embrace personal holiness in our lives, there is unity in the body that cannot be stopped that the world desperately needs to see. A divided church has little to say to a divided world. So let us rally around not an organization, not a set of doctrines, 
but around the truth. It's all about Jesus. Who created the world, who came and lived a sinless life and died for the sins of man and offers salvation to all who will receive grace abounds. Doesn't mean we've got to be perfect. He'll take us right where we are, but he doesn't leave us there. He loves us too much for that. And as we grow in that relationship, we grow in Christ's likeness to be more like him. And so his light is reflected ever brighter in us and through us. This is what happened at this time in the church. And it's what desperately needs to happen in our day. So I want us to look this morning at power, the power of unity in Christ. And we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. The Holy Spirit has fallen. Pentecost has come. The people have been filled with the Spirit. Thousands have come to faith in Christ. And God is doing great and mighty works among them. So much that they have been filled with the Holy Spirit. They're speaking the Word of God boldly. And many are responding. So much so that they are under a Holy Spirit driven initiative. They have committed to sell their sell goods and sell things and bring the price of them together and make them available for the community of faith. Wow, that's commitment. It's the kind of commitment I love to see. It's the kind of commitment I have seen in many here as people have shared with one another, helping one another. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. But there was a couple who decided not to go along. They pretended to. In other words, they were a threat to the unity in the body. So let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, reading chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife, also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young man arose and wrapped him and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. <coughs> and Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. <coughs> then Peter said to her, how is it that you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? <coughs> Can you give me some water, please? <clears throat> Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women. <coughs> so that they brought the sick out into the streets. And laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. May God add his blessing reading his word. Thank you. May be seated. It's an amazing thing when the power of the Lord pours out on people. Lives are eternally changed. And when the body is unified in that, that all hearts are in accord around the gospel and full of his spirit, there's power. Things take place. 
there's some truths I want us to gain from this this morning. And first of all, unity is a priority that God preserves a unified body. What he did with Ananias and Sapphira to some might seem harsh. Somebody said a small group, what's the bottom line? I said, hey, tie the rails. No, but no. That's not really what he's saying here. They had made a commitment. The people had made commitments to sell things and to bring it all. And a commitment had been made and they decided, this couple amongst themselves, let's just not quite go along, but we'll pretend to. And only by the power of the Holy Spirit could Peter have known this. But they were lying. They weren't really in unity with the body, and that was a threat to the power of the Spirit working through the body. And so God took them out. Were they saved? I'd like to think they were. We really don't know. The Bible says that liars don't inhabit the kingdom of heaven, but, you know, at some point in time we've all fudged. I think that's talking about a lifestyle. So we don't really know whether they're saved or not. It may well be that they were. God just took them home because they were a threat to the well-being, to the unity of the body. <coughs> the word said, then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in, found her dead, carried her out, and buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Now, we're not talking here about whoa. Whatever this guy says, we better do because look at that. I'm sure there was some of that. But what I think more than anything was they realized we better take our commitment seriously. Beloved, that hasn't changed. <clears throat> There's so much consumerism. So many church programs designed as consumer products to appeal to that consumer mindset with little emphasis on unity. Folks, unity's got to be the priority. Where there's not unity, there's nothing. There might be a good Sunday school report or a good report of attendance records that bragging rights on the new numbers, but that's not the power of the Spirit. You can have a mass of people and not have the power of the Spirit. I'd rather have two people and have the power of the Spirit than 10,000 without it. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 said, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Now note that. He says six things he hates. Seven are an abomination. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies. Those are the six things. What's the seventh thing? and one who sows discord among brethren. See what he's saying? I hate these acts, but this is an abomination. This person is an abomination, the one who sows discord in the body. And part of the problem is in our day, church discipline is largely dead as a dodo bird. People are allowed to do any kind of thing, spread any amount of discord, any amount of gossip, any amount of hatred, any amount of ill will, I call them spiritual viruses. They'll plant a few lies here and there and let them take root and spread like wildfire. And it's allowed to go unchecked. And guess what? The church has no power. Church has lost her power because the church has lost her holiness. There's not a commitment to personal holiness. Folks, the things we think, the things we see, the things we do have an effect. <coughs> Psalm 131 says, 133 says, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Unity in the spirit has power. And personal holiness matters. Because a lack of it quenches the spirit and the power of the, in the person's life and therefore it compromises the unity of the body. We praise Jesus on Sunday and then this week, somebody, uh, how many church people are going to go home and see who the bachelorette decides to shack up with this week and call it entertainment and think they've got a viable walk with the Lord? I'm telling you, holiness matters. 
In Mark 3, 24 through 26, our Lord said, If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. And Satan is divided against himself, and he won't stand in the long haul. He doesn't mind throwing his followers under the bus. I've seen that over and over again. As long as they're causing chaos and keeping people from truth. <coughs> Holiness matters. The second truth is that God does miracles in a unified body. Folks, the age of miracles is not past. Miracles are still being done. Roxanne works at a call center for prayer line. She never gets a call from anybody. I hadn't had, had a call ever that people saying, today's my birthday, would you pray for me? On her birthday, she got two calls like that. You know, she said, well, today's my birthday too. See, God put all that together. God is still in the miracle business. He's still in the life-changing business. And in a unified body, spirit-filled, he's still doing miracles. In verses 12 and then verse 15, it says, Through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. See, they were out in the world. They were at the local square fest, except they had it called it Temple Fest. I mean, they had it there at Solomon's Porch, a gathering of believers, and they were seeing miracles performed. Verse 15 says that so much so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches so that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. How did it happen? Because they were all in one accord. How did the Holy Spirit come? They were all in one accord. How were they shaken? The place shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit because they were all in one accord. How were these miracles happening? Because they were all in one accord. Folks, there's power in unity in Christ. Matthew 6, 4-6, Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives in his own house. And this is speaking of Jesus. Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid hands on a few sick folks and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about in the villages in a circuit teaching. Our Lord Jesus was limited in power because of disunity among his own people. But then he says in John 14, 12, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Folks, he's still in the miracle business. He's still healing the sick. And there's some things we're able to do today that he didn't have the ability to do. Right this very moment, live streaming anywhere around the world, someone can tune in and listen to this message. Wow, what if Jesus had had the internet? World evangelization would be a lot easier. But the reality is we're great things still being done, but it's done through unity in the Spirit. I commend to you a church in our community that years ago, about 15 or so years ago, was wondering if they ought to close their doors. They had been pretty good size, but they were down below 200 and had a good sized building and they weren't sure what they were going to do. And they called a young pastor and folks, something great happened because they were broken, they were contrite, they were repentant, they sought the Lord, and they were willing to do whatever he said. And that little struggling body is called Long Hollow Baptist Church. God sent them a young pastor, and God did a miracle. Now about six campuses, untold thousands of lives touched because of unity in the power of the Spirit. 
Now, I'm not saying they're perfect. Crazy things for me to preach that way, so how far you be gone next week? No, not really. But the point is, God moved, and he moved through the miracle, through the miracle of unity in him. He still honors it. Romans 12, 3 through 5 says, For I say through the grace given to me that everyone is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but think soberly as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. We have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we be money, uh, many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. What he's saying is God gives various gifts to various people. Where would we be if I decided I was called to work in the nursery? Well, somebody's got to preach. Where would we be if next Sunday, you know, Ron Mathis decided he was just called to be a soloist? Oh, my goodness. God gives us various gifts that we're called to use. And he doesn't give all the same gifts to the same people. but we're called to exercise those gifts in the power of His Spirit and in concert. And you know the beauty is, we come from various backgrounds. And this is what I love. You form a set of doctrines that maybe are interpretations of verses and say, if you don't view these verses the way we view them, you're not part of this fellowship. That's what, that's what people do in various denominations and groups. We come together saying, we believe this is the inerrant word of God. We agree on that. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and it's all about him. We agree on that. You know what? With those two beliefs, we share a view of salvation, gospel salvation, and a view of scripture. We can come together in unity. We don't necessarily see all the verses the same way because we come from various backgrounds. Because we've had different life experiences. God has applied those verses in our lives in different ways. We don't have to absolutely line up on every one of those things. We'll work through those together, but we can still be unified in Christ. That's the miracle of the church. And that's the miracle of unity in the body. He said in Romans 16, 17, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. So, well, wait a minute now. We just, uh, you know, let's just all get along. Let's all get along, but let's all get along around Jesus and his truth and the power of his spirit. And if we can't agree on that, we, we're not going to have much fellowship. Now, that doesn't mean we don't love the lost person. But that does mean you don't come in here and profess like Ananias and Sapphira to be a part and then begin to sow discord. <clears throat> God takes that seriously. And we ought to too. A third truth is that God saves throat, souls through a unified body. God works through a body of spirit-filled believers and he wins souls to himself. So all the believers were increasing, increasingly added to the Lord multitudes, both men and and women. Why? Because they were all in one accord in the power of the Spirit. Acts 2, uh, 46 and 47 says, Continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. That's small groups. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. God works through the unified body. I'm so glad anybody can walk through this door and experience the love of Christ. But God wins people through a unified body. Unity must stay a priority. Yes, doctrinal purity. Yes, of, of, of adherence to the word. But folks, there's level ground at the foot of the cross and we're all struggling. And it's okay to struggle. But unity is a priority. Unity in truth. 
including this morning, Jesus, just before his crucifixion, prayed a prayer. Prayed a very important prayer. In John 17, he said, I do not pray for these alone, but for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. Do you realize, who did he pray for? Them and those who would believe. Who is that? Jesus prayed for you and for me. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I've given them, that they may be one just as we are one. That tells me the power of the Spirit is in every believer to have unity in him. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and I have loved them as you have loved me. In other words, that we in Christ together grow in the Spirit and in the knowledge of Him, grow in one accord, and in His power, people are drawn to Himself. Folks, that's the church, and that's the will of God. The real power it's not in the size, it's not in the denomination, it's not in the budget, it's not in the numbers, it's not in the music style, it's not in the amount of padding on the seats, although I'm glad we got well-padded seats. The real power is not in any of those things. The real power is in Jesus and Him alone. And in unity among believers by His How can we get there from where we are today? Well, if you know Christ as Savior, I encourage you. I feel a great burden. There's got to be a return to personal holiness. There's not enough difference between us and the world for them to see their need. We have slowly but surely allowed the grime of the world to come upon us. Jesus washed his disciples' feet at the end of a long day. And he said, you're clean already, but you need your feet washed. What he was saying is the grime of the dirt builds up on you, the grime of the world, worldly thinking, worldly attitudes, they accumulate unless you allow the Holy Spirit to do a daily cleansing. Then and only then do you find peace and power in Him and a return to personal holiness? You begin to want to jettison from life anything that hinders your relationship and your walk and intimacy with Him. That's not always easy, but it's a matter of personal choice. Oh, it's not politically correct. Oh, it's not popular. Oh, around the water fountain at work when they're talking about a certain show, you might not be watching it. You won't know what they're talking about. Jesus takes unity seriously. And personal holiness is our calling as believers. That we may be one in Him. And that the world may believe through what they see in us. Father, we praise Your name today and thank You for loving us and caring for us. We thank You for the power of unity and the reality, Lord, we take seriously the responsibility that we have to be unified in you. Jesus, pour out your spirit among us that we may be filled to glorify you and further your kingdom. We ask in Jesus' name and God's people said,